Let's welcome Mao Sheng, who is our curator of entomology in LKC NHM. He's going to share about the type of insects that you may find in your home, potted plants or mini gardens. Okay, can let's get started. Okay, all right. So yes, thanks at least for the quick intro. Uh, I hope everyone has a good lunch, right? So to reintroduce myself, I'm Maoshen, and I will be talking about you know where you can find these mini bees around. Um, all right. So I think most of you would already have known that it's kind of adapted from the movie Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, right? So I want to lay out some definition here. Um, basically, we touch, with regards to definition of fantastic, it's not looking at something that is extraordinary good or something that's really remarkable. It is more on the wow side and the strange ones, right? So, and when we talk about mini bees, we're not going to be talking about like tree shoes or sunbirds, right? The small creatures. We're even talking about smaller animals like the insects, right? So, yes. So, this is some of the insects that you actually can find them in Singapore. And really, in our world, there are actually many, many fascinating creatures. You know, there are some of them are dull looking, some of them they are more extrover uh, extravagant. And some are big, some are small, and some are very, very tiny. And yes, I mean, there are some that might be very obvious to see, and there will be those that will be hiding in plain sight. Now, before I move on, I'm just going to share something a bit from the Fantastic Beast movie, right? So I guess some of you, or not most of you, are actually familiar with this particular scene, right? So Newt Scamander is actually sharing uh, that he's actually writing a guidebook, right? Basically, the guidebook is not an extermination guide as uh, Tina has, has thought of. He is actually writing a guidebook, right, to actually let people know more about the different kind of creatures, you know, understand them, why they should be protecting them instead of killing them. So the objective of my talk for today is basically along that line. You, know, you get to know which ones are your friends so you don't anyhow end up killing them and which ones that are maybe not your friends and then you know how to manage them. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, right here. Okay, so let's look at the residential areas in Singapore itself, right? How much life is there around us? So when it comes to these areas, you know, we tend to see there's a lot of high-rise buildings and the main occupants are the humans, right? Us. Now, if we were to put the humans aside, how much life is there left? No, let's say maybe we have our pets, you no know, cats and dogs. Uh, then we have the miners, right? And then maybe on certain occasions you get pythons, wild boars, and cats. But how much life is there to it? So let's look deeper into it. All right. So if you would look at the aerial view of Singapore, right, there is actually a lot of vegetation. We have trees, we have treelets, shrubs, grass patch. All of these are actually able to stop out life that the, of the animals that we spoke of earlier. And you have to remember, Singapore is actually a city in a garden. So where can we actually first start finding these mini creatures around? Um, anyone has any idea? Where shall we start? Actually, the place where we can start is where you are actually watching this live video, right? It is right in your own home, right? So let's uh, elaborate more on that. Okay, first one. Uh, I guess most of you are actually very familiar with this scene, right? Now, these past few days, we have been having a lot of rain. Uh, and usually after the rain, you, know, you have a lot of insects that are coming to your houses. Right, and then um, it depends on where you stay. You are closer to the forest or you're closer to the reservoir, you may have more chances of these uh, insect swarms. Right, so these particular scenes are very familiar, and usually the common ones that you will see are your ants and your termites. Right, these flying ants, flying termites that come to your house, then they swarm around, then they have their dead bodies all around, or sometimes all their wings. Right, but on the other hand, maybe sometimes during the night or sometimes early in the morning, you might see these ones. Right? You get to see different kinds of moths like staying still on the walls of your house or say maybe the walls of the corridors. Right? Some of them are dull looking, some of them are beautiful looking and some of them are really are camouflaged. You, know, you just have to look a little closer and you might see, oh, there's actually a moth there. But on maybe some rare occasions and if you are really lucky, you might see this particular moth. Right, so that moth that I'm referring to is right now shown on screen in the center bottom. Right, anyone knows what moth are you looking at? 
Okay, if you know the answer, you can keep it to yourself first. But for those who are not sure, uh, think about it. The answer will come to you later. Okay, so insects that can be found at home. I think let's look at some of the common ones, like these ones, right? You have toilet flies and you have some of the uh, smaller moths, right? Flying around. Toilet flies are the most commonly found around your drainage holes, right? Uh, yeah, some of them can be quite annoying. Uh, at times, you get house flies or flash flies flying in your house, especially near the uh, food that you have discarded or near your rubbish bins. Uh, and at times, if you have bread crumbs around or cookie crumbs, you will get these ones, right? These are ants, right? So, you're like, example, the species of feral ants, right? They're so tiny and they will start to scavenge for any of the leftover food. And maybe and other times, you will get to hear noises uh, around your house. You heard pop talk the kind of noise itself. Then you're wondering, maybe is it someone knocking on your door or, some, or your window? And you realize it's actually a shepherd beetle, right? And one of these beetles, scarab beetles, you know, sometimes they fly into your house and they just do not know how to get out and they start knocking to your cupboards or your doors or your windows. And the last and but not least, the most infamous insect that can be found in all homes. I'm sure most of you would know what kind of insect I'm referring to. One that can actually scare most people, and that is your American cockroach, right? So these are the general kind of insects that you found at home, but I'm going to show you some other insects that is actually might be living in your, in your house, but you may not see them around, okay? So you're going to have to do this. Yeah, the, this already tell you the size of the insects. They are actually very tiny. You may actually need to use a magnifying glass or even a microscope to tell them. But small, um, is it, does it mean anything? This is something to tell you. They may be small. So it does sound like they are easily uh, to be exterminated. But they can actually be in certain sense be quite powerful, right? Uh, in a way that they can cause economic loss, right? A huge loss of money. So let's look at some of the possible insects that can be that so in a way damaging. Okay, first stop is this one. I think you guys might have seen this particular dirt bags uh, around your houses, right? Especially the corners or the places that you, know, you don't really visit, right? These are actually known as your case-bearing moths, right? And how they look like is something like this, right? So they do have little cases in, made out of uh, their silk as well as the little debris in order to protect their soft bodies. Because the only the first two segments of their body is actually sclerotized, which they are able to uh, move around. And how they look like when they turn into adults is hang on, uh, this way. So this is how they actually look like. They are, they are very tiny moths. They are almost uh, around, say, 4 to 5 mm in length. Okay? So, and, uh, so who are the ones that will cause the most damage? It's actually the caterpillars. The adults, right, are actually very similar to your atlas moth. Okay? They do not feed on anything. So they cause no injury to your fabrics. How about these ones? I think some of you might be familiar. Some of you maybe are not familiar with this, right? These are actually known as your carpet beetles, right? They are actually the larva of your carpet beetles. And this is how they look like when they are adults. Okay. They are actually much more colorful, right? Uh, again, the most damaging ones are actually your larvae, the larvae itself. They will actually, you know, not only eat your fabrics, you know, they eat your, some of your clothes, your carpets, right? The, some people may also be allergic to the hairs of the uh, carpet beetle larvae also. So, you know, sometimes when you wake up from, from, from bed, you might feel, hey, why are there some like red patches on you? You think, might, is it uh, bed bugs itself? But actually, if you were to look a little closer, it's actually due to the uh, bristles of your larvae, of the uh, carpet beetle larvae. So, Yes, so looking at these two itself, right? Uh, in this sense, these insects are actually in a way beneficial to us. Why? Because they are actually eat up the so-called uh, undigestible uh, carotene of your fur, or, you know, some of your fabric itself. Otherwise, you know, you get a lot, lots of dead uh, carcasses all around. Okay, but they are, um, say, bad for us because you know in case you want to keep our clothes you know or some our plushies right these guys can actually damage them before we even know it because they are so tiny they actually avoid our detection 
Now, um, I'm going to digress a little bit. It's looking at this particular picture here. Anyone knows what are we actually looking at here? Right? They look a bit familiar, right? Maybe to some of you, maybe not to, all, uh, to some of you, right? So if we had to have another look at it, okay, you see there's actually a power of bones there. And then you see there's a lot of grubs on it, okay? And if we have a much more larger picture of it, it's actually this, right? What you see is actually the digestion of your dead animal bodies, right? By this, what we know as your domestic beetles. Right. These guys are actually very uh, famous for having to clear up dead bodies. You know, they clear up your flesh, your fats, uh, uh, the ligaments, you know, leaving the bones behind. And they are very, very voracious uh, feeders that they can actually uh, clean up the entire corpse within a few days. Right. So I guess maybe that is, could be a hint to how you can clear up any dead bodies you might have. Okay. So these are some of the beaters. Now the next one I think would be more familiar because this actually went viral over the past two months. Is this one, right? So I guess all of you will be uh, have seen this uh, particular video where Uncle Roger was really, really disappointed you know, that Hersha did not wash her rice uh, before, cooking, before cooking it. So what's the reason of washing the rice? You want to wash the rice is to get rid of the excess starch, right? This makes your rice less sticky. Uh, at the same time, some people are actually washing the rice to get rid of uh, the potential arsenic. But there is another reason why you should wash the rice. It's because of these guys. These are actually known as your rice weevils. Right? These guys are very, very tiny, okay? smaller than the grain of rice. So why do you wash the rice? When you wash the rice, what happens is that the adults, the beetles, will start to float on the surface of the water and then you can just wash them away. And then you won't have that little black specks uh, when you're eating your rice. Now, um, so what about the, the larvae, you know, the grubs? Where are they found? They are actually found inside the grain of rice. So if you were to see like, your rice grains having little holes, you know that there are actually potentially rice weavers in there. Now, uh, if there are actually a few of them in your rice, it's actually not too bad. They don't cause any uh, harm to you at all. But if there is a lot of them, I think it's more or less that your rice is already in a way damaged and that you best not eat it. Because, you know, when you eat a rice, something what goes inside the bitter, something else has to come out, right? And that is your poop. So with the amount of uh, rice weavers inside your rice, right, you can Im imagine how much poop might there be. And you don't really want to eat them at all. Now, so we're talking about food itself, okay? There will be another kind of insect that will visit your grains and cereals. Something like this. But these guys don't just eat for um, your grains, right? They will also go for your books. So if you do have any old books at home, right? Uh, if you have not touched them for a very, very long time, if you flip open them, you might see that some little holes in there. Uh, you might first think, oh, they are actually caused by silver fish. But their holes are actually not caused by silver fish. They are actually caused by another kind of grub. These ones. These are actually known as your secret beetles. And this is how they look like when they are adults. They are even tinier, so it's about 2 to 3 mm in length. And they can actually cause a lot of damage just um, before you even know it. Now, the reason why they're called secret beetles is because they were actually commonly found in tobacco products. Okay? So, but... You know, when you say eating books, you know, like even eating the glue of the books, is if to us we know that they are actually not nutritious at all. So why do these beetles actually go about eating them? The reason is that in their body they harvest a certain species of yeast that can convert into vitamin Bs. So that is how they can change something uh, material that's non-nutritious into something nutritious for them. Now the next one. Another one that uh, some of my friends, you know, over the past few months when they face humid weather, they see these little specks on their wall. I think some of you may have seen them before also. Okay. These guys are actually known as your book lice. Right? The, the reason why they are being bring present is because when your environment is humid, what else will grow on them? mold and fungi and these guys will actually feed on them so when you see these guys are moving all around you know that okay it's time to ventilate your room a little bit more okay and the other one is that in particular species of these uh, book lice right they are in a way a little useful mm, why is that so right it's actually but this particular species these guys are mainly wingless right so they will actually go about crawling and 
last year, they actually identified this particular species of book lice to be a predator of mosquito eggs. Now, usually when we think about mosquito eggs, they always tend to float on water, but not all mosquito eggs are actually laid on water. Some of them are just laid beside near the water, okay? Uh, like say your potted plants, you will see little black specks. Those are actually the eggs of the mosquito larvae, uh, mosquitoes. So the bug lice or the book lice will actually go about eating them, okay? So uh, I think I've talked enough about what kind of insects you can find at home, and most of them are, they are generally pests. Uh, what about insects outside your home? So, like particular uh, in this scene, right? You see, you know, that's the base of your HDB blocks or your houses, or say along your corridor. These are actually very familiar sites, right? Now, now you all remember the moth that I did mention earlier in my slides, right? Anyone knows what moth are we actually looking at? Anyone? Okay, this is actually known as your hummingbird hawk moth. So in a way, you can say that it's actually made comprised of three different animals. You have your moth, right? So because it's an insect, uh, it has your hawk, right? So it does have an aerodynamic shape for very fast flying. But why a hummingbird? This is actually the reason why it's called the hummingbird hawk moth. Okay, so uh, right, so these are the three different uh, ins, uh, animals that comprises of your hummingbird hawk moth. So the reason why it's called a hummingbird hawk moth is because of this particular video here. Okay, uh, sorry, now you don't hear any audio, right? What you see is that the hummingbird hawk moth is actually moving from flower to flower, right? Sucking up the nectar and it actually hovers like your hummingbird. That is why it's called the hummingbird hawk moth. Now, if you do see this hummingbird hawk moth, count yourself very lucky because uh, there has been a saying that hummingbird hawk moths are known to be a lucky omen for you. Okay, and then, yes, and outside your home, some of you guys might have seen this particular nest, right? Honeybees nest. So uh, usually when it comes to honeybees, we know they're actually beneficial for us because they provide uh, honey for, uh, for our food. But at the same time, when you look at honeybees nest, right, there is not only just the honeybees that will be in the nest or on the nest, right? You might be able to have another rare chance or if you are very lucky, you might see this particular moth. This is known as your death's head hawk moth, right? Or sometimes we call it the bee robber. So what do they do at the bee's nest? Is actually they will go about raiding them. Okay, and let me show you another video, right, of the death's head hawk moth raiding the bee's nest. Right, uh, okay, sorry, there's no uh, audio at this point in time or so. But what you can see is that the hawk moth will actually enter through the entrance of the bee's uh, nest itself. And then it goes from cell to cell, drinking up the nectar and honey. But you realize that none of these bees or almost none, uh, or none of these bees are actually attacking the hawk moth itself. Why? Because the hawk moth actually mimics pheromones that will look as if they are uh, part of the bee's colony. So the bees will think, oh, this is just another bee of their kind, you know, just bigger inside. So they don't go about uh, hurting it. Okay. All right. Then next one. Now, hawk moths are not the only moths that you see in the bee's nest, right? There will also be your wax caterpillar also. And this is actually how they look like when they are larvae, and this is how they look like when they are adults, right? So these guys, they will actually eat up the bee's wax, which is actually non-digestible to us uh, humans and mammals. Okay, but if you were actually to use this for something benef beneficial to us, it's actually this, right? Scientists recently have found out that these wax caterpillars or wax worms are actually able to eat plastic and they can actually be able to be a solution to our plastic crisis. Okay, now something closer or something reported in the news is this one. Okay, so during this uh, entire pandemic, I've seen friends who actually goes out to nursery and to buy plants, right? So what we call it as the botanic boom, right? To relieve stress from staying at home. So some of my friends actually shared with me some of the plants that you actually keep at home, right? Uh, or sometimes they go about urban farming or home gardening. So here's the thing. I would like to check if any of you has done any, uh, say, urban farming at home, right? Uh, let me try to get. Okay, so I set up a poll, right? So let me know how many of you are actually doing a home gardening or doing urban farming, right? I want to get an idea of how many of you are actually a part of this trend right now. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, right, so all the polls are votes are coming in. I can see that most of you are actually uh, doing gardening and urban farming at home. Okay, so let's have a look at the share the results itself. I hope you guys can see. So here itself, we have 65% of you are actually doing uh, gardening or urban farming. Okay. Now, when you do this uh, kind of uh, gardening and farming itself, right, you're not only going just to get plants, you're going to be getting other kind of insects. So, so a good example of them will be like your Javanese grasshoppers, right? You have caterpillars of your tussock moth, right? And this is how they look like when they're adults. And maybe at times you will get uh, friendlies like your praying mantises. Uh, you got shoe bugs. There'll be all different kind of other insects also that might be present. And if you are, say, living near a water body, say a reservoir or a large pond, you may even get dragonflies. Now, when you have these potted plants itself, right, you, there's a chance that you might see this particular hard mud balls on it. So what are these hard mud balls? Some of them may have actually openings of it. So these mud balls are actually caused by your mud double warps. Right. So what they do is they actually gather bits and pieces of mud to, mute, uh, to make these particular uh, mud balls. Okay. Now, when you open up the mud balls, you may actually find caterpillars in there. This is because the maternal warps will actually bring the caterpillars into the mud, uh, mud balls itself. Okay. What are they used for? These caterpillars are used to feed the young. Right. So here, we have a video showing you that the caterpillar is actually feeding on a live caterpillar. Uh, the larvae feeding on the live caterpillar. Right. The caterpillar is still alive even though it's a bit dehydrated because you know, it has been paralyzed by the uh, warps. So you keep feeding on it and it grows very fat and becomes the next stage of uh, next generation of warps. Okay. Now, not only finding caterpillars, you may also find spiders also. And the number of spiders can actually be quite large. Now, they may not be made by your mud double warps. They may actually be made by another kind of warps known as your spider warps. Okay, so these guys itself, what they do is they actually will paralyze your spiders and then they will drag them to the nest. And that is where they will actually lay an egg inside or outside of the spiders and let them feed on the spider, uh, let the young feed on the spiders. Okay, I'll show you a video, right? Uh, they may not make the mud balls, but sometimes they'll actually make uh, a nest right in the potted soil. So this is what happens. So it's actually preparing the hole before it drags the spider. The spider is actually in the background. So you can see it's actually dragging the paralyzed spider into it. And you can see the so-called fear in the spider's eyes or so. Right? So once it's done, you'll come out and then you start to cover up the, the hole right? to prevent any other insects to might actually uh, say eat up the larvae of the warps. Okay? But that at times, these warps can be quite savage. Once they sting the spider, they will cut off all the legs. Why? Because some of the sting or the venom itself right, only temporarily paralyze the spider. Now, so that, this is for your warps itself, right? Warps this size are actually in general uh, not really aggressive, right? Unless you disturb them. So you do see them around, you can just leave them alone and then they won't cause you any harm. Okay, now you may also have seen this particular twirly thing on your plants or so, right? Okay, you see twirling, twirling all around and these are actually known as your twirler moths. Right. So the reason why they twirl is they are actually suspected that they actually try to confuse their potential predators. Right. So you may see some of these twirler moths. Uh, their young actually tend to be like some leaf finders. So they will actually be hiding in between the layers of the leaf in order to feed on it. Now I'm going to digress a little bit because there's one particular moth that was uh, described quite recently in the past few uh, recent years. Okay. It's this particular moth over here. Now, this particular moth is also a twirler moth, right? Uh, but does anyone know who is it named after? Right? You look at the head of the moth, right? It actually, its scales uh, actually resembles a person's hair. I'll give you another hint. This person right now is actually one of the presidents uh, in the US. Anyone knows? Right? It's actually named after Donald Trump. Okay, now, so it's named after Donald Trump because of his hair. So it does look like as if, you know, it's like a small moth. Uh, but one thing when they, they actually they, they do the description of this particular moth is this. Okay, so for one, the study notes that the genitalia is comparatively smaller than the closest, closest relative of another species. So I'll just let you draw any conclusion on to regards to Donald Trump. Okay, next, let's move on. 
Hey, sometimes under the plants, you might see little white specks, right? These are actually known as your white flies. Right? Of course, white flies are pests and you, don't, uh, you do want to get rid of them. So uh, the adults are actually white in color, but the young may be actually black in color. But among the white flies immatures, right, you may actually see another kind of insect or so. Can you see it spotted? Can you spot it in the picture here? Okay, I'm uh, going to have a closer look at it. This is actually your Encarsia warps, right? They are actually a parasite to your white flies. So being a parasite to your white flies, they can actually be a form of biological control. But uh, this is only effective when you're inside a greenhouse gas, I mean a greenhouse itself. Uh, but in an open area, it's actually not possible because of all the fogging as well as the use of pesticides and insecticides. Now, uh, white flies are not the only ones they will find among your plants, right? When you do your gardening or your community gardens, right? You will actually find maggots. Now, when I say maggots, everyone will always think, oh, maggots are dirty because they will turn into house flies, right? But not all maggots are actually, say, harmful or in a way dirty. Some of, these of, uh, some of them are actually quite useful. Like, for example, this particular maggot of a fly is actually feeding on a white fly as well. Okay, so what it do is actually once you feed, it goes on to another. So it also helps in the biological control of white flies. This actually is known as your uh, Eclitoxenus fly. Uh, the mangoes itself are actually quite green, so they can kind of camouflage on the plant. But once they turn into adults, this is actually how they look like. Okay, now let's have another uh, short quiz here. Okay, now there are three different kinds of insects that will actually visit a plant. Now there's one, two, and three. Now I'm going to start another poll again, right? Tell me which particular insect here is uh, definitely a pest to your plants. Okay, so let's see. Uh, uh, right, let me get the poll up. Okay, so I launched the poll already. Now, which one of these three uh, is actually a definite pest to your plants? Right? They look very similar, but only one of them is actually a major pest to your plants. Okay, I think we got most of the results in already. Let's maybe just a few more seconds. Okay, all right, let's end the poll now. Let's share the results. Okay, right. Yes, actually most of you got it correct. Number one is actually uh, a pest. Number two and three are not really a pest. Okay, number two is may or may not be a pest. Number three is definitely not a pest. So let's uh, review the answer. Okay, so this is actually the different kind of insects that you find in your plant. Number one is the mealybug, and that one is definitely a pest. But number two is a planted plant hopper name, and number three is actually a larva of a ladybird. Okay, now let's look at uh, number three first. What is it about? Now, these guys, uh, when you talk about ladybirds, right, they are actually the predators of your aphids. So, they are definitely your good guys, right? Now, for this particular species, this is actually how small they are. They are actually even tinier than the common ladybird that we find uh, on our plants, okay? And then, let's go on to the next one, number two, your platted plant hopper nymphs, right? These guys may or may not be pests, depending on how many they are. Right, they have actually substance on their body is actually to defend themselves against potential predators. Now, when they turn into adults, they actually resemble like thorns on the plant. Okay, so these guys here, well, yeah, sometimes they, even though they do suck plant juices, uh, but depending on how many they are, they may actually be a pest. Okay, now I'm going to last launch another uh, last quiz over here. Right, I show you five different insects that will actually visit you when you have flowering plants uh, around you. Okay, now I'm going to start the last poll. Okay, what you need to do is basically, from this poll, pick out which ones are actually the ones that you do not want to disturb them when they visit you. Okay, right? If you can recognize them, you will know which ones are actually the potential ones that might be easily provoked. Okay, right? But a majority of them here are actually the ones that know they won't disturb you, I, uh, you if you don't disturb them, right? They are generally harmless. But two of them here can actually sting you. But which are the two? Okay, I think the results are in already. Maybe just uh, five more seconds and let's see. All right, okay, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. All right, actually most of you do are able to recognize which ones are the ones that you do not want to provoke. Right? It's definitely your one and two. So who are they? 
Right. So these are the different kind of insects that will actually visit you. Number one and number four are the ones that you don't want to provoke them. Right. They are your warps and your bee. And the other two are like your flies and then you have also your moth. So what about hoverflies, right? Hoverflies itself, they are useful in two aspects. One of them is this. How is it useful? Right? Aphids are definitely a pest that we don't want to have our plants because they will suck our plant dry. So what do they uh, hoverflies do, right? So hoverflies, they come in different shapes and uh, colors. They actually tend to mimic the colorations of your bees and warps. So the adults will be useful in pollination, but the young ones or maggots will actually go about hunting for aphids or so. So they'll clear up any aphids that you find on them. Okay. Now, how about the next one? This one over here looks a bit like your bees and warps or so. So what is it? A true fruit fly. So this is how you look like when you see their top view, right? They look as if they have a stinger in there. But the stinger there is actually not used to sting us at all, right? Even they, if they uh, land on us, they won't be able to penetrate our skin. This particular sharp pointy part is actually used for oviposition of your eggs into your fruits, right? That is why they're called fruit flies. So once they oviposit, right, the mangoes will actually develop within the fruit and then you will start to eat the fruit also. So this is actually a way on how you can tell whether a fruit is actually uh, organic or whether does it have pesticide. So when your fruit has a lot of black holes on it, right, you know that, okay, this fruit is actually organic. But, um, is it safe to eat them? Yeah, you know, generally it's safe, especially, you know, maybe you just have only one or two black dots. It's fine, right? People will say, oh, it's just uh, extra protein. But uh, when you have too many black dots itself, uh, it's very unappealing. I think it's best that you throw them away and not eat it. Okay, now, uh, just to, before I end it off itself, I want some, to show you something that's closer to home. Okay, something very closer to home is in regards to uh, not only we are having to face the crisis of the COVID-19, right? we also face another situation with the uh, rise in dengue fever. So my question here is, how many different mosquitoes are there in Singapore? Okay, think about it. How many mosquitoes do we have? So when we talk about mosquitoes in Singapore, we generally know about three main mosquitoes, right? The Aedes, the Culex, and the Anopheles, right? You have your dengue fever, your, your malaria, which is also dying out. But how many species of mosquitoes do we have all around us itself? Anyone have any idea? Is it maybe 10? Uh, is it 50? Or is it even like 80? Okay, so think about it. I'll give you a few more seconds before we move on. Okay, and the answer is we have at least 182 species of mosquitoes in Singapore. That is actually really, really a lot, right? But even though we have that many species of mosquitoes, right, not all of them are actually vectors of diseases, right? The vectors of diseases are the ones that I mentioned earlier, the Aedes, or Anopheles, and the Culex. The rest of them are generally are fine. Okay, so yeah, basically I'm just showing you all the different kind of insects that you have in Singapore, right? Uh, as well as the ones that you can find at home. So you don't really need to go out into the forest in order to find all these different fascinating creatures. Okay, so I'm uh, thank you for your time and to listening to my talk. Thank you. Uh, we have one question. Uh, do the domestic beetles clean flesh more effectively than maggots? Um, I would say yes, definitely your domestic beetles are very good. Why? Because uh, if you were to say some of the natural history museums overseas, right, they actually have secret uh, rooms, or not say secret rooms, uh, specialized rooms in having to clean up uh, carcasses in order to display, I would say, our specimens of bones. Right? They actually finish up the dead bodies very, very fast. So I would say they are actually more effective than the maggots. Okay, uh, next question that we have here. Uh, tell us more about sand flies that bite us when we go to the beach. Uh, this one I can't really say much for sure because I'm not really say, uh, specialized in looking into sand flies. So I can't really say much unless uh, say that you really proper, uh, properly cover yourself up, uh, put on uh, insect repellent in order to wall off the flies. Right? Uh, let's see. If you, if you have a favorite insect, what, which will it be? Mm, okay, let me see if I can show you what's my favorite insect itself. Uh, for me, wise, my favorite insect is actually a species of cockroach itself. What we know as your peel cockroach. Let me have show you a quick one. All right. I hope you all can see this particular cockroach. This is actually found in Singapore itself, right? What you see here is actually the male and this is actually the female. So not all cockroaches are just dark brown and black. Some of them are actually quite colorful. 
Okay, so yeah, this is actually one of my favorite kind of insects here. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go on to another question itself. Uh, let's see. Mm, can cockroach squeeze through a rubbish chute? <laughs> that is actually a very uh, interesting question. But yes, definitely can actually squeeze through. Uh, I think there was a research being done to show how much space is actually needed. Uh, the cockroach can actually accommodate in order to squeeze through a gap. And they actually can squeeze through a gap as, uh, how to say, as, as narrow as 3 mm in length only. So yeah, so they can actually squeeze through very small gaps itself. So if you want to like to keep cockroaches out, right, you must totally seal it, not just have any gaps at all. Okay. Uh, right, uh, then the next one. Uh, what insects feed on mealybugs? Well, mealybugs itself, I think you do, I mean, um, the hoverflies, right, the maggots don't just go for aphids. They can actually go for your mealybugs too, right? Uh, and mealybugs are also, say, uh, they also do get parasitized by some uh, wasps or so, which are actually very, very tiny. So, but with these parasitic wasps, they are only be more effective when they are inside an enclosed area itself. Uh, but uh, let's say in the open environment wise, it's going to be very difficult to find uh, these uh, insects that will actually uh, prey onto your mealybugs. So that depends. Uh, if you do use a lot of uh, insecticide, you also will chase away these uh, insect, uh, insect predators also. Let's see. Uh, next question. Mm, do you like domino cockroaches? Uh, domino cockroaches, okay, domino cockroaches or why they are called domino cockroaches is because they are actually black in color with white spots. So they are a bit like your dominoes in terms of coloration. Um, domino, I haven't really seen domino cockroaches before uh, up front, but uh, they are actually quite cute in a way. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, next question. Why only certain insects are caught through bugs? Okay, so uh, when we talk about bugs itself, right, uh, let's say in the new world, okay, uh, we always think that, you know, bugs are in general comprised not just the insects. We think about like your other creepy crawlies, your um, uh, spiders, your centipedes, right, uh, your other uh, tiny arthropods. Uh, but when we talk about the true bugs, right, you only refer to one particular group, right, known as your hemiptera. These are the uh, sap suckers or the plant suckers itself, right? Your shield bugs, your white flies, right? Uh, these are known as your true bugs. So when you talk about bugs, these are the groups that we will actually, for us, uh, entomologists will refer to. Okay, uh, maybe let's see, I've got one more question. Have you seen uh, velvet worms in Singapore? Uh, velvet worms? Hmm. Whether do I see? I would say I have seen them before. So we do have actually velvet worms, but uh, they are quite rarely seen. Yeah, uh, yeah, and velvet worms, they are actually quite unique in a way of having to try to uh, prey onto other insects, right? They will squirt out sticky fluids, right, in order to snare their prey. Okay, let's see. Is there anyone has any more questions about uh, bugs? Let's see. Um, next one. How many entomologists are there in Singapore? Uh, <laughs> this one is very hard to tell. Um, I think there's actually a growing number of entomologists in Singapore itself, right? Um, Numbers are growing, but I can't say for sure how many they are, right? Uh, and entomology is actually a very, very big group. So if you want to say uh, a specific uh, entomologist itself, right, then it may be a certain group of them. So uh, Because each of us entomologists, we are a bit specialized in a certain group of insects. Or right? so let's say uh, a person who's specialized in bees and wasps, you know, or a person specialized in ants. Right? In the museum here, we have four entomologists uh, who were specialized in different groups. So we have one specialized in true bugs, one on flies, one on ants, and for me, I'm specialized in cockroaches. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see another one. Um, maybe, let's see, uh, maybe just two or three more questions before we move on, okay? Uh, let's see, how many cockroaches are there in the world? Uh, there can actually be quite a lot of cockroaches, but because they are actually understudied, uh, the numbers are still quite, uh, in a way, still quite small. They're yeah, actually quite in the high hundreds or so. Uh, but that depends on where your associates are staying in, right? If you want to say for Singapore, right, uh, we do know about the pest cockroaches like your American, your German, right, uh, or your greenhouse cockroach, right, uh, the Suriname cockroach. We actually have about close to 30 species of cockroaches in Singapore. The numbers are actually increasing, right? Because uh, as more and more of them are actually being discovered. Okay, uh, I think last question itself. How many bug specimens or species has the museum collected? 
Uh, this one, I think uh, you all may have seen the video uh, earlier that Eddie showed about the uh, potential insect survey and Mandai, right? So we actually do have a lot of uh, insect specimens in the museum. Numbers are really, I would say, you know, millions or you could even approaching to in the billions or so, right? Depending on the size of them. Uh, how many species there are, um, it's hard to tell because the species, uh, we are actually been discovering new ones uh, almost every year uh, itself. And so numbers will keep increasing. So it's going to take more than a lifetime in order to know what's the exact number of species of insects in Singapore. All right, thank you so much, Mao Sheng, for sharing about the insects, about bugs, about cockroaches. Oh my gosh, yeah, cockroaches. <laughs> that we can find and answer so many interesting questions from the participant. I hope you enjoyed the talk. We will take a 10 minutes break and join us back at two with our lovely education ladies from Outreach and Education Unit. You can use, uh, use that same Zoom link and password to join the next program. See you back at two.